played. You see any of that in the 100-point game by Wilt Chamberlain? Things were a lot different. We don't know how many field goals he uh, attempted. We don't know how many minutes he played. I think he played about the entire game, just if, 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 uh, if not for a minute, you know, a minute or two less. So understand this was a totally different world, and some things could get lost. And, uh, you know, add Tupperwine found a reason to complain because some details were missed. Okay. Um, I'll read a few things to you. And try to get this. I have video. This video is pretty incredible. If you stop by my table, you might have seen it. This video was found around, right around 1960 in somebody's attic in Connecticut. Um, some sharpshooting historians were thrilled to hear that there was video. Um, yeah, the other way. No, I, I had it right the first time. They were thrilled to hear that there was video, and I may need some more technical help here, you know, um, to have video of the Topper Wine shooting. Uh, it wasn't uh, the 1907 event, it was an event in the 1940s when they were touring. Um, but uh, they found it in, a, in an old pot. Uh, uh, pots and pans, when Dot and Ernie Lynn passed away, they were the uh, couple that took over for the Topper Wines for Winchester uh, and carried on for a number of years. They had this film of the Topper Wines shooting. So it's a great, I can write all the words I want to. In fact, there are, there are words in here from some writer who went to an Adolf Topper Wine, Plinky Topper Wine ex exhibition and said words just don't describe it. To see it uh, is where you really get an idea. So. The, funny, the fun thing I had with writing this book and, and really going through it was what happened to Ad Tupperwine when he was going through this event in 1907. Have you ever all day, or not all day, but around Christmas time licked envelopes or licked, uh, uh, you've stamped envelopes and you go to sleep at night and you're stamping envelopes and whatnot? Um, you can imagine what happened with Ad Tupperwine. Um, let's see here. So to get to 72,500 over 10 days, he was shooting every three seconds. Uh, now he reloaded his own gun. Um, now, he had everything preloaded in a tube. All he had to do was open uh, the magazine, uh, open the loading chute, and, and they would, the, the cartridges, the bullets would slide right in. Uh, so he'd, uh, he'd get 10 in there. So he was, even with all that, he averaged about three shots a second. The 1903 Winchester 22 was the first semi-automatic that the company ever marketed. Uh, and it was quite, uh, it, was not, uh, it was not the crank. Everything else before then had been the hand lever. Uh, it was an, a semi-automatic weapon. Uh, so he'd keep those at every three seconds. Ad, however, felt like he could find some del deliberation in all this rush. It actually opened to him when he found a rhythm with the target thrower and waited ever so routinely for that block to reach the apex of its rise. That's when he'd shoot it when it was hanging there. Well, not hanging there really, but at least when the block offered a short glimpse of slowing down. It was almost like the blocks drifted, like his mind, drifting, drifting off. Another block went up. Another block went up. Nothing, no noise. The judge was silent. Did he forget to shoot? No, there was no bullet. Was the gun jamming? Another block went up, and another. The bullet's just not coming out of the end of the barrel. The blocks would not stop going up. And now maybe this was it. And his intention to make sure he towed a line 25 feet distant from the targets, as prescribed by his childhood hero, Doc Carver, adds fixation on the distance requirement got out of hand. Or was the strain on his eyes playing tricks on him? Because he was shooting again now. Yeah, the gun worked, but the blocks were a mile away. How was he going to hit those, 22, those with a 22 rifle? It ought to be easy enough. The blocks were just hanging there. They were hanging there in a circle all around them. They wouldn't come down. This was nuts. And now the darn gun again. The rifle was firing off shots backwards. This he reported. Uh, he wrote a, a report to Winchester and was, at, and was interviewed about this shoot years and years and years later. 
these nightmares, and it's how I open up the book. I found it incredible, these nightmares that just keep coming as he was shooting. He would go to sleep every night, beaten down, and he would have these nightmares of these blocks hanging in the air, circling around him. He'd shoot, nothing would come out. He'd shoot, the bullet would go out the butt end of the gun. Uh, the, the blocks were a mile away. It was just incredible nightmares. The, the mental strain had to be bad, as bad as the physical strain. And the physical strain was bad enough um, you know, how does it feel to close in on 72,500 wooden blocks? Uh, here, Ad says, I had very little good sleep, Ad complained. I am in constant physical misery. This is about five or six days into the shoot. My arms and shoulders ache. My neck muscles are painful. My whole body aches, as if somebody had pounded me all over. His right hand and wrist cramped. And Ad was saying that this caused him a great deal of pain. No kidding. Um, and he, he wouldn't speak to anyone during, during all this. Um, he didn't want to be bothered. Um, let me find this. Well. Well, I may have to ad lib here. Here we go. Like I said, he didn't want to be bothered by the crowd. It was normal for him to go and shoot, and there would be hecklers trying to knock him off his concentration at these events where he was just performing as an exhibition shooter. Um, So he wanted his shooting to be pure, but he often seemed to draw a heckler in the crowds gathering at his and Plinky's exhibitions. This included a stop in New Mexico when Ad believed the table that would display his guns and ammunition had been moved by pranksters next to an obscured bumblebee nest before the start of the show. They'd set up, they'd went off, and then they came back and the, the table and everything was out of, out of place. So that he thought that pranksters had done this. When, uh, so they put it over this bumblebee, or bumblebee's nest. Uh, when one of the bees buzzed through the performing area, Ad heard Chekler, Heckler's chant, Shoot the bumblebee! Shoot the bumblebee! For a while, Ad said, I endured the disturbance, knowing full well that a bumblebee is a very poor target while buzzing around erratically. Finally, Ad had enough of the loudmouths and their buzzing bumblebee. So at the peak of his circle, I shot him, and that angry bumblebee just vanished from our sight. Those troublemakers tucked their tail and left the tent. This I got in a couple of different sources. Uh, uh, some, it, is, it definitely happened out west, either in New Mexico or Bisbee, I, I believe it is, Bisbee, Arizona. There are a couple of, uh, it happened somewhere out west. I couldn't pin that down. Uh, oh, that's the wrong, I'm sorry, that's the wrong. Yeah, it's the other one. Yeah, that's Herb Parsons who came after um, Ad Tupperwine. He was very popular as well. So how good of a shot was Ad Tupperwine if 72,500 targets and missing only nine over 10 days doesn't show you? Well, he, he shot a bumblebee. <laughs> he shot a bumblebee. Um, and kind of getting into the physical pain, um, here's what Tom Fry said about his shooting. Remember, he shot at more than 100,000 over 13 days. Um, because of the repetitiousness, Tom explained, you are shooting in a dream state. The rhythm helps, but nothing can take away the cramps which develop in your forearm and shoulder. This hurts so much that the fact that the skin is peeled off your trigger finger isn't as alarming as it otherwise would be. So they would put liquid skin on his finger because his finger had been chewed through by the, by the vibration of the gun. Uh, Tom Fry did not complain about nightmares. He complained about physical pain. Uh, I mentioned that he was kind of a tragic figure, a foil to Adolf Tupperwine. Um, a lot of bad things happened in Tom Fry's life, one of them being an automobile accident that he required surgery to where he had about two or three vertebrae fused. This happened about two or three years before he did the 100,000 uh, target shoot. So you can just imagine. I know I talked to people who traveled with Tom 
by car from Montana to the Grand American Handicap in Ohio, and Tom had to stop every few miles because his back was killing him. Uh, he often wore at shooting events his, his you, can, you remember these old braces that would tuck down below your pants, and he would wear those. I can't imagine being able to shoot very well, but still he fought through that. Uh, now, it kind of did mess with Tom's mind, shooting at 100,000. Um, and I mentioned that he was taking some muscle relaxers, and he, didn't, he said they didn't usually work. If the pills no longer registered their full kick with Tom, he found a more natural way to put a little flair into the proceedings. He didn't mind the five-minute breaks anymore that he would take, you know, about once every hour he'd take a five-minute break. When they came, Tom got away from the blocks. He grinned. He pointed off some ways where a crow was gliding not too far off the ground. He'd creep along, perhaps 50 yards, not worried about the pain involved in moving his rifle into the aim position, and fire off a round that would eliminate the crow. If I hadn't seen it, a spectator rattled off, I'd never have believed it. The guy finishes triggering 1,000 shots in 60 minutes, then bird stalks, just for one more shot. So I, obviously, this guy's in a lot of pain, and there was something going on with his mind for him to go off and, and during his breaks, continue shooting uh, and shoot at these crows. Uh, and then I mentioned Plinky, and they had a wonderful relationship by all accounts. Uh, they performed together for, uh, for 40 years. I mean, you can, and her work was really incredible. You're going to see some, some great stuff in here. Uh, I mentioned in 1907 the first women to, to compete in the Grand American Handicap, and by seven years later, she was the only woman uh, among four or 500 men shooting. So 